Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, good night, no matter where you are in the world. Welcome to another episode of uh, Social Isolation, which apparently we're still calling it. All good. Uh, got heaps of people in the live chat already. Awesome to hear. Uh, if you are brand new to uh, to become a basis, if you have no idea what this is, uh, I would love to give you something that is directly related to what we're talking about today, which is how to practice soloing. And that is a, a, a video I made a while ago uh, called Anatomy of a Bass Solo. And now I'm not sure if you guys know uh, the Donny Hathaway album uh, with uh, Willie Weeks playing bass. It's like a classic uh, thing. And he, he plays this like amazing bass solo. It's like my favorite bass solo of all time. And uh, in, in, I make, made this video where I like break it down, like show you exactly how it works and what makes it really cool and all that kind of stuff. And I'd love to give it to you free. So I'm just gonna drop a link in the comments right there. Uh, just sign up for the, the free video underneath that, Anatomy of a Bass Solo, super, super fun, and it's directly related to everything we're talking about today, which was uh, a question I got on uh, yesterday, not yesterday, sorry, um, Tuesday's live stream. Uh, we, it was like right at the end of the of the whole thing, and uh, Christopher Long, who's actually on, uh, on the stream right now, he asked, how do I practice soloing? I'm like, oh man, that's a big question. That is a super, super big question. So we're gonna tackle it today. It is, I could literally talk for hours about this, maybe even days, because it's such a big, uh, big process, uh, but I'd love to kind of break it down a little bit. Now, I'd love to hear from you guys, first of all. Uh, I know uh, I've, I've, like, I've heard hundreds of bass solos, and I'm like, that's an amazing bass solo, uh, but I'd love you to tell me uh, the favorite bass solos you know of. They could be uh, uh, super simple, they could be super complex. Uh, I'd love to know what you guys are listening to, uh, and if you could as well, tell me why you love it. Yeah, that's that's a super important thing as well. So let me know uh, your favorite bass solo of all time, uh, or if you've got more, send me more as well. And also why it's so cool, why you love it so much. At the moment, I'm super into. I've I've mentioned this before. I'm super into the Wolfpack album uh, live at Madison Square Garden, and there's like some amazing bass playing on that. I'm definitely going to cover some of that in uh, future videos. Uh, but yeah, it's. It's gonna be it's gonna be fun. Uh, probably not this, definitely not this week. Possibly next week. Who knows? Who knows? So I'm still waiting on some uh, some favorite bass solos to come in. Ah, uh, one of my favorite ones from that one is from a song called Beastly, which is like a classic Wolfpack song. If you guys know it, I'm sure you yeah, you know it all. You know all about it. It'll be fun. But uh, let's see. Okay, so Christopher says I'm really interested in improvising the in between stuff which I consider a form of soloing. So do you mean uh, like uh, like fills and things like that? Like in between like playing grooves, like playing groove, 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 and then something a little bit extra, and then uh, and then going back to the groove. I think that might be what you're talking about. Brock says Cocaine by Jimi Hendrix. Awesome, nice. Nice vintage. <laughs> okay, cool. So let me just say this. Now, uh, we've got a couple of uh, in the... Uh, so far, the only one I can see is this one from Brock. Uh, yeah, okay, Christopher says Tasty Fills. Now, uh, one thing that no matter like what your favorite bass solo is, uh, you know, all that kind of stuff, no matter what kind of uh, your favorite solo is in general, whether it's on a guitar or a piano, uh, Charles Ray Long says uh, Bootsy Collins on Munchies for Your Love. Awesome, yeah, I love some Bootsy. Uh, Jordan says Anesthesia, Pulling Teeth, love the classical arpeggios going into a fat metal groove. Yeah, this was like, I was super into this song. Uh, Oh, I would have been in high school at some point. I would have been like 17 or 18, maybe. Yeah, I was I was super into it. I got myself like a little Digitech wire pedal that sounded horrible. <laughs> but that's part of the part of the process, right? Uh, but yeah, so we've got Bootsy, we've got who's like a funk player, we've got Anesthesia, which is like a metal thing. We've got Jimmy up here, uh, who's like playing like blues rock kind of stuff. Now, what is one thing that they all have in common? It's that they trigger some kind of emotion, yeah? And it might not, they might have triggered the exact same emotions in like you that it does for me, but no matter what it is, uh, it's going to be triggering some kind of emotion. Yeah, whether that's like complete awe, or maybe it makes you cry. Maybe it uh, makes you really excited, pumped up. Uh, maybe like listening to uh, anesthesia, going into a fat metal groove, you're like, ah, doing all that kind of stuff. All that stuff, it they all trigger an emotion, and that's the most important part of uh, you know building your bass solo. You want to be trying to trigger that emotion as much as possible. Uh, so this comes down to it. It's uh, it's part art, part science, and like the you know it's going to be slightly different for each style of music. So for example, a minor pentatonic solo that only sticks to one key, it's probably going to sound bad if you're like playing 
like a jazz song that moves like through three or four different keys, right? It's just not going to work. Uh, so what I want to talk today uh, is the science part. Now, there are two parts. There's the part that's the art and there's the part that's the science. I'm going to be focusing on the science. Now, why is that? It's because it's, in general, way harder to create great art if you don't understand these foundational things. People, a lot of the time, uh, especially uh, people who aren't necessarily pros yet, but they're like kind of in between. They're not beginners. They're like getting a little bit kind of intermediate. Uh, and there's this, uh, <laughs> there's this thing where like, oh, well, I can jump straight to doing the, the really fancy stuff. Uh, I would recommend you really focus on uh, the fundamentals. And this is even when you're like a professional, like you can, you can never get too good at the fundamentals. Yeah. So, uh, that's, I mean, we can talk about a lot of things, but the, you know, the ones we're going to talk about today are first of all, good sounding notes. Now this seems pretty obvious, right? Play notes that sound good. Uh, but this can mean a bunch of different things to a bunch of different people. Also, your definition of what a good sounding note is, is going to change. So, for example, if you're playing over a, let's just say a, what are we, uh, ah, let's do a dominant chord, like a D7 there. We've got D, F sharp, A, and C on the top there. It's like a, like a, what, you, what you play over like a blues progression, right? Now, there are so many different options that sound good over this kind of sound, right? Now, obviously, the root is always going to sound good. The notes in the chord are pretty much always going to sound good. But everything else around that, there's, it's very, very... Um, what's the word? Subjective. So, for example, I play... Over that kind of chord, I can play like a... like a blues scale kind of thing and that's going to sound really good even though there's notes in there that are technically incorrect so for example in this kind of chord we've got an F sharp in the chord a major third but that whole time I was playing um, an F which is a minor third I was playing the sharp 5 a whole bunch which is definitely not in the chord as well should be that one I'm like playing like basically a minor triad over what's essentially a major chord and even using a flat five almost like a a diminished kind of sound over a major chord technically it doesn't actually work it's not technically correct but it can still sound good that's the beauty of it you don't have to necessarily be playing uh, notes that fit within like correct uh, chord scale structure theory stuff all the time and in fact when you can kind of get, get out of that it kind of becomes a whole lot more fun uh, and the more you do this the more you realize that there are no wrong notes as long as you uh, dress them up in a way that makes them sound good then you're totally golden so what are some other options we could po possibly play over this uh, d7 chord we could play uh, like a mixolydian kind of sound that would be the quote-unquote correct uh, right notes to play over that specific kind of chord uh, you could also play like a Dorian uh, kind of sound. And that's going to sound good as well. Because it's like that kind of bluesy thing. All that kind of stuff. Uh, so that's just over one chord. We've got a couple of different options there. We've got the, uh, what did we say? The, um, note, the notes within the chord, the blues scale kind of thing, the mixolydian, the Dorian. And there's definitely overlap between all these things. Uh, but that's just over one chord. And you can even get even further into things and uh, use like little passing notes. So you can use, for example, uh, if you're playing on that kind of thing, anyway. That kind of stuff. Playing a major seven where there should really be a minor seven in the chord, but you're kind of making it work with that kind of passing note, doing that kind of stuff. All this stuff, it's just to say that, you know, what what a good sounding note is will change over time for you and what it means for you and all that kind of stuff. But at the very start, when you're like just starting out, uh, it's really helpful to know exactly what notes are in which chords that you're playing. So if you're improvising over just a static progression that is just like a one chord thing, this is relatively easy. Uh, if you're playing over a song that has lots of different chords, it's then super helpful to know where all those all those chords are in, in, on your bass, how to play them, and all that kind of stuff. So, for example, if you're playing, uh, let's say, 
let's 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 use that D7 chord. Let's say you're you're playing a two five one in the key of G. So you're going A minor seven, D D seven, G major seven. Play it up here a bit. That kind of stuff. It's super helpful to know the notes of all those chords. So you'd go. A, C, E, G, the notes of an A minor 7. Da, 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 da. And then you go to the next chord, the D7. Play the notes of that chord. Da, 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 da. D, F sharp, A, C. And then play the last chord. G major 7. G, B, D, F sharp. So you have A, C, E, G, G, F sharp, A, C, G, B, D, F sharp. And if you can play those notes when those chords come up, that's going to be super useful. Now, you probably don't want to just do it in a very mechanical way like that. Just... That's not like very interesting. Uh, but knowing where they are and how they fit within, uh, on, like all over your bass, it's going to be super, super helpful. And there's like, most people when they talk about improvising, they, this is what they talk about. They t talk about playing the quote unquote right notes but there's so much more to it than just that obviously that's super important but there's way more to it the one thing that people tend to overlook is the next one which is super solid rhythm this is a trap that i see um a lot of uh kind of beginner slash intermediate uh, students fall into they uh they know all the right notes they've like practiced all the right notes they know all their scales they know like okay so if i'm playing a two five one not only can i like play the chord tones but there's like a also a scale associated with each of those. So you could go over the first chord, over the second chord, ah, oh, pardon me, over the, the one chord, yeah? And uh, that's correct, and that's very, very true, but then they fall, uh, fall down with the rhythmic aspect. And that's arguably more important than the notes. Because, you know, you can play a wrong note, a note that doesn't sound quote-unquote good, and you can make it work, uh, but if you play, uh, if you have solid rhythm, but if you play all the correct notes and they sound out of time and they're like kind of sloppy, people will just like, their eyes will glaze over, they'll like look away, they'll go and get a drink, they'll start talking with their mates, you know, all that, all that stuff that you don't want when, you know, you're improvising or soloing and that kind of stuff. So how do you develop um, super solid rhythm within your soloing? Uh, I've actually put a video together about this uh, a while ago, uh, and it's a... Uh, I'll just dump it in the comments right now. There we go. It's called. It's all about conscious rhythm and actually picking your notes. Uh, sorry, your rhythms in a really conscious way, rather than just kind of like winging it and doing all all that stuff. And it it gets like very kind of prescriptive, but it's uh, the whole process is to uh, pick a specific rhythm that you're going to use and then play through whatever you're playing through with that. So it might be like a constant stream of eighth notes for a certain amount of time, then a certain amount of rest. That's, I think, one that I use in the... Uh, yeah, Christopher says, uh, fewer notes, more interesting rhythms. Exactly. You can build a whole solo around really good rhythm. You don't need to necessarily play like all the fancy notes and know all the fancy scales. Like, it's not that... I mean, obviously you want to, like, like I said, play good sounding notes, but you can make everything sound good with solid rhythm. So... Um, the conscious rhythm idea is picking notes, uh, sorry, I keep saying notes, picking specific rhythms and then running with them. So for example, uh, you might go, uh, let's say we're in the, the in 4-4 four, four, and you want to play a, a full bar of eighth notes and then a full bar of rest. So it'll be one, two, three, four, da, 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 rest, two, three, four, two, three, and two, three, and, two, three, and, ah, uh, uh, messed that one up, <laughs> played, a, played a quarter note when I should have been playing an eighth note. Uh, and this, at the start, it's going to be kind of a drudge. This is like the very, very scientific, quote unquote, part of it. Uh, but it's going to um, really solidify your conception of what the rhythm is that you're playing. And that's super, super important, because like I said, Bad sounding notes can be made to sound good with solid, solid rhythm. That's super, super important. Um, and I would definitely recommend checking out that lesson uh, if, you, if you've got the chance. I, I can't remember how long it is. It's maybe nine to 12 minutes. That's my average, kind of. <laughs> uh, but if you, um, if, if you check it out, you'll see exactly how uh, overlooked rhythm usually is for 
bass solos and all that kind of thing because like I said, people are mostly focused on notes. Now, uh, let's take a bit of a pause here. Let me know in the comments, what are some other, um, other elements we could use in our bass solos? Uh, Christopher's been saying, uh, when in doubt, start slapping. <laughs> and John says no. <laughs> Classic. So, let me know the other, other important elements that you might think are part of a good bass solo, like a really good bass solo. There are, there are tons of them. There's going to be tons of right answers here. And uh, even if there's, you know, quote unquote wrong answers, they're probably going to be right in some, in some cases anyway. So let me know in the comments what those are, because uh, I've, got, I've got a couple more I'd like to talk about, but I'm sure you guys have, uh, have different uh, ideas as well. <laughs> Darren says, like the video. Yeah, you can if you want. I'm not, I'm not like crazy about likes or anything like that. Ah, Guitar Man says, not really a bass solo, but I love the opening to another one, Bites the Dust. Absolutely. Classic. That is a really classic one. Ah, John says, don't make it too long. Yes, this is something that I definitely used to do. Uh, Someone like chuck me a bass solo and I'd go for like eight minutes. Like, no, 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 dude. What, and, and that was the point where I like, I didn't have eight minutes worth of stuff to say on the bass. So definitely, definitely, uh, you know, it's always better to make it too short and leave people wanting more than go on for too long and being like, dude, shut up. <laughs> Pino Palladino, yes. Rests, this is the super important one. Yeah, silence is an incredible way to first of all capture attention. So if you, if you, if, if you play a phrase, so you might go, uh, Silence and people are like oh, because what does it create? Silence creates tension because people are going to be like oh, what's going to come next? What's happening next? Yeah. So rests and silence is a great tool to use when developing bass solos. Absolutely. Uh, I'm actually going to talk about that a little bit as well. Uh, Evan says a good drummer. Yeah. If you're playing with a, with a solid band, it makes things a whole lot easier. If you're playing with people who uh, aren't as supportive as they could be, makes things uh, super, super uh, difficult to, you know, create something really, really good. Um, all right, let's uh, go back. So um, one thing that you can use uh, that is, you know, bread and butter in terms of creating an interesting bass solo is repetition, repeating your ideas. This is, uh, this is another trap that, I should recall this, like the traps that like uh, bass... It, improvisation improvisers fall into because this is another trap is they just have these massive string of ideas and nothing ever repeats but re repetition is like the most important aspect of creating melody right think about any uh like any blues song it's going to be like uh what's a good example you ain't never been a hound dog crying all the time you ain't nothing but a hound dog it's the same phrase just repeated on a different chord, albeit, but it's the same phrase repeated, same melody, same uh, same phrasing. Chords different, but that's the only thing. You ain't nothing but a hound dog crying all the time. Well, you ain't. Then there's a variation there, so we get a phrase, a repetition of that phrase, and then a variation on that phrase. You ain't never got a rabbit, and you ain't no friend of mine. And I think that song only has like two verses. There's the there's that one, and there's um, what's the other one? They say you were high class, that was just a lie. Same thing, they said you was high class, that was just a lie. And then the same thing on the F chord, they uh, said you was high class. I can't remember what kids in exactly, but you know, that's the thing. That was just a lie. And then I think there's even, you ain't never caught a rabbit. So the, sec the second part of the phrase is a repetition from the first part of the phrase. So really there's only three ideas in this whole song. There's, you ain't nothing but a hound dog crying all the time. Uh, you ain't never caught a rabbit and you ain't no friend of mine. And they said you were high class. That was just a lie. Only three ideas in that whole song. And it's like massively like popular, super, super famous. And it's just three ideas. They've made a whole song with three ideas. If you can, if they can make a whole song with three ideas, you can make a whole bass solo, which might only be like 30 seconds to a minute. You can make it from one or even just two ideas. So let's, um, let's, let's talk about how to do that. Because this is super, super... Um, it can be weird because you have to track what you're playing. So um, let's let's just say I'm playing a blues. Two, three, four, one. 
So my first phrase might go one, two, three. Yeah. Second phrase. Same thing. Maybe have a variation here. Yeah, so we've got theme, theme, variation. That's like the classic like uh, uh, idea that you can use to compose, to create solos. And it doesn't necessarily have to be uh, super long ideas like that as well. You could shorten them up. That, those ideas were like four bars each. So um, you might do it with a, a two-bar phrase and repeat that. Or you might have two-bar phrase and then a two-bar rest and then play the two-bar phrase again followed by two-bar rest. So that might sound like this. So one, two, three, four. <laughs> Two, three, uh. I want two, three, four. I want two, three, four. Yeah, so, and that, that ties into what uh, I think Ranger said before about using rests. Totally. That's like absolutely a good way of doing things. Two bar phrase, two bar rest, rep re repetition of the two bar phrase, and then another two bar rest. And then you could even play the thing again if you wanted to. But, you know, repetition is what's going to um, get people's ears pricked up. They're going to be like, oh, Ooh, and then if you create an expectation, uh, then that's all you're doing in, in terms of repetition is creating, like playing a phrase, repeating it, so we create a pattern there, and then what's going to happen next? Are we going get, to get something that's the same? Are we going to get something that's different? And that's when people are going to be like, ooh, ooh, okay, cool. Uh, okay, Dante says, knowing the chord changes, absolutely. That was like the first, uh, first thing we talked about in terms of playing good sounding notes. Christopher Long also says, think melody, absolutely. Melody, absolutely. And then we've also, uh, Charles Ray says, the opposites. Play a rhythmic solo instead of a melodic solo. <laughs> now, both of these are true. You can play a melodic solo. You can play a rhythmic, you know, a rhythmically interesting solo. Uh, they're not mutually exclusive, but you can think in those different ways, and it's going to be totally fine. Uh, Christopher Long asks, how about singing your solos to practice? Absolutely. This is something I talk about in uh, an old video of mine. I think it's called the... Um, Secret to Melodic Soloing on Bass. It's like one of the first videos I ever made. And it's about exactly that. It's about singing what you're playing, uh, but not necessarily the other way around. You don't want to uh, play what you're sing. Uh, sorry, you don't want to sing what you're playing. You want the, the music to start up here, flow through down to your fingers and onto your bass. You don't want it to be like in your fingers and then kind of like work its way back up to your brain. So you want to be like, if you're playing over that C blues, you might want to go... Da, 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 da. Ah, I've, I've lost my phrase now. <laughs> uh, or whatever it was, I can't remember. But if you can, if you can do that, if you can sing the phrase and then play that phrase, uh, then that's going to be a super, super um, uh, useful exercise for you. And this is tricky. Uh, I, if you're going to do this, I recommend you start with super, super simple phrases uh, and make sure you're not kind of going too, too hard. This is a, a super common problem as well, is I'll like tell people to sing what they're playing and they'll like sing this like eight bar phrase. And I'm like, can you remember what you played eight bars ago? I can't even remember. So, you know, I, I mean, they might, but the trick to doing this is very, very simple starting and then working up from there. So you might go one, two... I want two, three, four. Da 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 yeah, and then if you can do that and do it really, really consistently and do it really well, then you can start uh, uh, singing what you're playing, like the kind of George Benson kind of thing. So you might go... All that kind of stuff. And the ideas, as always, should come from up here, not in here. Yes, the music comes from your mind, not your fingers. If you can do that, then you are going to be in a super, super um, good position. 
Now, uh, I do have a couple more things to talk about. Ah, this is another one as well. Uh, you can use uh, elements of storytelling and building intensity through a solo. This is one that uh, I was definitely guilty of not doing. I'm like, oh, bass solo time. Let's play as fast as possible. <laughs> and like try and do all the, all the fancy stuff that I've been like working on in the practice room. But no one cares about what you're like working on in the practice room. They just care about something that sounds good. So if you're trying to build a solo, craft a solo, you want to think about uh, things in terms of telling a story and building intensity. You don't want to come out of the barrel uh, out of the gate, just kind of like wow, playing as fast as you can and doing all the stuff, because then people immediately shut down. I've seen it happen. They just shut down. They start talking to other people. They like they don't care. You need to make people care about what you're doing and what you're playing and what you're saying through your instrument, right? And the way to do that is to not come out of the gate guns blazing, going as as hard as possible. The trick is to actually slow down a little bit and uh, make sure that uh, you're crafting and telling a story. So if you think about uh, like classic storytelling, there's like a, a really, really st uh, strong starting point and then action rises and rises and rises. There's like a climax somewhere and then it kind of falls and falls and falls. You want to think about uh, your own bass solos in the same kind of way. So if I was doing, let's say, if I was doing like three choruses of a 12 bar blues, so I've got 36 bars to work with. That's not a huge amount. But you can think in terms of, okay, so my first chorus, I'm going to, you know, stay pretty pretty calm, I guess, not go too hard. Second one, you know, build it up a bit more. And then maybe halfway through the third one, I've got my, like, most intense point, And then you want to kind of come down a little bit as well. Yeah, because you don't want to, like, go, <laughs> you don't want to end your solo at, like, the most high point. You want to kind of trail it off a little bit so the next person or whatever happens next has somewhere to go. Yeah, so if I was playing that same blues, let's try that. Let's do three choruses. I'll do... Uh, one that's like chill, a bit tame, one that's kind of building up, uh, and then one that's like, you know, the emotional climax, and then build up from there. Uh, the, sorry, fall down from there. So I go one, two, I want to. So we've got, you know, uh, first chorus, pretty chill. The next one we like building, I can't remember exactly what I played, but I played like ideas that repeated a little bit. <laughs> Stuff like that. So we're kind of building intensity a little bit. Uh, also, the first one used a lot of uh, space. Oh, sorry, I should have mentioned that first. The first one used a lot of space as well, like Ranger was saying at the very start. Uh, you're using uh, rest and using silence to kind of draw people in. People are like, oh, what's going to happen next? And then you, you've you earned the right to, you know, do all your flashy stuff and like play all the licks that you've been practicing in the practice room. Because people won't care about them unless you give them a reason to. Yeah. So absolutely crucial to like incorporate those rests, those breaks into like the chill part of your solo. And then once you once you kind of get into, for example, the second chorus that I was playing, you can do all that stuff where you, you know, play a bit faster, maybe play a bit higher, maybe repeat ideas that build intensity. And then you can like really go for it when you're, you know, at the climax of, of uh, whatever you're doing and then kind of taper off from there. Uh, and this is all is very dependent on everything else that's going on in the, the, in the song, in the band. So for example, uh, sometimes it does make sense to end a bass solo on a high note because in general, the intensity of a song of when a bass solo happens is going to come from here. It's going to come down at least a little bit because, you know, there's not a full rhythm section with, uh, you know, giving full support and all that kind of thing. So it does, you know, 
naturally come down a little bit. So it may make sense for you to kind of build up to a certain point, give it to someone else and they can take it over from there and you go back to playing baseline or whatever it is. That's a super, super um, common thing to happen. Uh, oh, <laughs> I've gotten, gotten some nicer, best teacher of all time. Thanks so much, I really appreciate that. Um, and Tony asks, uh, am I teaching high school? Uh, no, I don't teach in high school. I used to teach in a couple of uh, universities, but I'm not doing that anymore. I'm just focusing on, uh, you know, well, I guess I'm not focusing on gigging anymore. <laughs> uh, but uh, I kind of gave away my uh, my uh, university job and then moved down to a bigger city where there was more of a music scene and, um, you know, focusing on doing all this stuff uh, to become a bassist and, you know, gigging and all that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, oh, this is super important. Thomas says... I love learning bass again. I was self-taught as a teen, but never learned the fundamentals. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, <laughs> it can be really hard uh, if you don't have that kind of fundamental uh, game really taken care of. But once you do have that, it becomes way easier to kind of do all the fancier stuff. But like I said before, you can never, never be too good at the fundamentals. Like you can never be too good at, you know, playing a solid groove. Like there's no such thing as, oh, that groove was a bit too good. Could you like bring it down a notch or two? No one's going to say that. They're like, man, that's a sick groove, you know? So fundamentals, super, super important. Uh, now, uh, let's see. Did you guys have any more questions uh, or comments about improvising, soloing, uh, doing all that kind of stuff? Now, I do know... Uh, while, while you're typing those questions into the comments, I do know that uh, Christopher asked about playing uh, more fills than playing uh, specific bass solos. And in that case, uh, the game is a little bit different because you want to like add intensity, add uh, uh, more stuff, but you want to also uh, keep the groove solid. So the important part for playing fills is not the actual fill, it's coming out of the fill. It's uh, you know landing on the root of the chord or whatever your target note is on beat one or wherever the, you know, wherever that phrase is supposed to resolve. So for example, let's say we're playing a, um, let's say you're playing like, like that's your groove there. So we're going G, G, B, B, C, C, D, 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 E, G. The most uh, kind of, what's the word? Uh, not appropriate. The most kind of obvious place to chuck a fill or improvise a little bit would be on the D chord and then resolving to the G, yeah? So if you're doing that kind of thing. The most important thing for that is landing on that G, like resolving the phrase. You always want that G to be there if you're um, you know, just playing it as a fill kind of thing. Yeah, you can do whatever you want there, as long as you um, kind of nail the, nail the ending and actually resolve that phrase. That's going to be the most important part if you're talking about improvising uh, or soloing, quote unquote, in the t in the context of like a fill, something like that. Uh, Range of Raf says, where do you get started learning about chords and such? Uh, that's a really good question. I do have a, a, a small series on uh, chord symbols and all that kind of stuff on my channel. Uh, it's from oh, not too long ago, uh, but if you search um, become a bassist for um, chord symbols, it'll, it'll help out a little bit. Uh, there's also tons of different uh, books and sites that all go through like chord construction and all that kind of stuff. Uh, yeah, so if you check out that kind of stuff, that'll help a lot. Um, there's also, you could check out my Ultimate Guide to the Modes as well, that kind of goes over chord theory and all that kind of stuff, and you can see how it works within the context of, of a key, which can also be helpful. Uh, if you just go to becomeabases.com and sign up for the Ultimate Guide there, that'd be super, super helpful, possibly. Uh, Christopher says, can't you come into the, uh, into the G a bit later sometimes? Sometimes. Uh, it depends on uh, what the rest of the band is doing. If you like, if everyone's hitting on the one, whoosh, and you come in on like the end of one or beat two, it's gonna sound like a mistake. So let's check that out. Let's try and uh, let's try and resolve this phrase on, let's say, uh, uh, let's try, try to resolve on the end of beat one. So one and, one, two, three. Oh, 
Oh, I'm not sure what that was. That might have been one of the. Ah. Uh, that could work. Um, it's it's like I said though. It's going to sound weird if uh, the whole band is like hitting on the one and you're hitting on something else. But it's you know it's definitely possible. Ah, also, Rob says uh, I find pentatonics have so much range to play with. Absolutely, pentatonics are great for improvising, great for playing fills. Uh, you could do that exact thing over this progression. Okay, so just like a like over the over the D, play like a D major pentatonic. Works really well. Uh, you can do the same thing just using the G major pentatonic as well. That'll work really well too. Yeah, pentatonics, you can get a lot of mileage out of them for sure. Uh, yeah, Christopher says as long as the phrase makes sense. Yeah, if the phrase, if like, yeah, totally. If, the, if it makes sense to play something other than the one, absolutely. I'm not saying that's like a hard and fast rule. That's like very, very flexible, depending on tons and tons of stuff, depending on heaps of stuff. Yeah. Uh, all right. Oh, this is interesting. Darth Ducky says, I studied mostly classical music through college and feel like I'm always uh, too demanding on my improv and can't get in the moment. That's really interesting. Could you, um, if, if you're still watching Darth Ducky, tell me what, exactly what you mean about that because that's, that's super interesting. Uh, what do you mean when you say you can't get in the moment? How do you feel when you're trying to improvise? That's that's super important. Uh, now we had a couple of other questions up here. Ah, okay. Brock asks uh, if learning a, if learning a song and is going somewhat fast, uh, it's better to try to learn it slower first and making your own solo. Is it better to learn it slow as well? Yeah. If something's too fast, just play it slower. Uh, I'm not sure if you were on the the live stream where I talked about like developing speed, but the trick isn't to try and play faster and faster. The trick is to do things at a super slow uh, tempo and then gradually work up from there. You don't go straight to like, if the song, for example, it gets to like 160 beats per minute. You don't go straight to 160. You start at like 100, 110, 120, and then you gradually work up from there. Uh, and this is like, yeah, if you're, if you're playing something that has lots of uh, tricky chord changes and stuff like that, just take it slow. Uh, if you can't play something slowly and do it really well and do it within your uh, capabilities, then there's no way you're going to be able to play it fast, right? So yeah, definitely, definitely learn things slow before you learn them quickly, for sure. Um, let's see. Darth Ducky says, everything good instead of just feeling it. Uh, so I'm not entirely sure uh, 100% what you might mean, but it sounds like maybe you're thinking a whole bunch uh, and not kind of just being... Uh, letting your fingers do what they want, right? I think it seems like maybe you're caught up in your own mind rather than just kind of feeling things in the moment. And if that's the case, uh, I would definitely recommend uh, singing your ideas and then playing them like I was talking about before. I'm not sure if you're here for that part, but definitely, definitely uh, super, super helpful to sing what you're playing and then make sure the music's coming from here and not your fingers. It sounds like it could be the case that you're like, uh, your music's coming from the fingers rather than the mind. You're like playing shapes or playing scales and all that stuff that you know is going to sound good. Um, but yeah, definitely, definitely want to try and make that connection between the mind and the fingers as well. All right. Uh, let's see. Tony likes music from the 60s. Nice. There's some def definitely some good music coming out of the 60s for sure. Uh, now... Let's have a look. Hmm, okay, sweet. So, uh, oh, what about ear training? Yeah, ear training is definitely going to help in terms of improvising. The more you can open up your ears, the more sounds that you'll have access to on a mental level. Like, you could p possibly play the sounds that you like know are quote-unquote going to work, but they're not going to always sound good to you unless you have that kind of ear training. Uh, yeah, definitely. Uh, you can like this is one of the things that you can never do too much of. Like no one's gonna say, "Oh, that groove was a bit too sick." Could you like take it down a notch? And no one's gonna say, "Oh, your ear's just a bit too good." Could you make your ear not quite as good, please? Like you can never do too much ear training. You can never be like, never have a good enough groove, you know, or never have a, a groove that's too good. Uh, Chris also asks, "Are solos typically high on the neck?" They can be. Uh, they're not always. Uh, but you know, if you're playing stuff that's like 
quite fast and dexterous, then it's going to be harder to hear it on the like the, the low area of the neck. It's going to be easier and it's going to be uh, in a more singable range as well if you're like up higher in the neck. That being said, there's like plenty of, uh, of bass solos that, you know, are just, you know, they're not necessarily, you know, they're just lower on the neck. So uh, the one I was talking about at the very start of the stream uh, is uh, on... Uh, uh, the the Willy Week solo and the solo just starts like this. And it, man, it's just like the sickest thing. It's so so cool. Um, and I've, like I said, I've got that video where I go through that whole Willy Week solo. Uh, I've, I've chucked the link up the up the top. I'll just grab it again for you, just in case you missed it, because it's super super sick. Um, and that's a that's a really good example of one that you know he does go a little bit higher in the neck, but he's never like playing like playing like all that kind of stuff up there, uh, because that's just not his style. Yeah, and like if you if you want to you know stick lower in the neck that's totally fine if you want to go up higher that's totally fine as well uh if you listen to um a lot of jazz recordings um you know it's like quite high quite difficult to play high up on the bass on an, on an upright bass uh you've got to like learn a whole different like thumb position technique and all that stuff so like a lot of older guys they just play their solos like like their highest note might be like a, a d maybe going up to a a g on the uh, an octave G on the G string, like it's totally fine. Like you don't need to play up high, you don't need to play down low. It's totally up to you. It's very much a personal preference. Uh, what do you think about chords or harmonies in solos? Uh, are you talking about playing more than one note at a time? Uh, if so, yeah, totally. That that's going to work really well. It's probably not going to work as well if you are uh, in the in the low part of the neck. So, for example, if you're down here and you're playing uh, more than one note, it's going to get super muddy. Versus playing the same thing up here. Is like crystal clear so if you got that sounds pretty rough <laughs> but if you go it sounds way nicer yeah uh, and there's like uh, check out uh, Otil Burbridge uh, he does like a ton of chordal solos uh, chordal ideas in his solos it's like super super cool um, but wow, well, okay, we've been going for nearly 45 minutes. So let's 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 call it a day there. Uh, once again, uh, everyone who's shown up, I really appreciate you. There, I'm like I'm like uh, knowing more and more names now. This is really cool. Like I said, I'm like super proud of this like little little community gathering we've got. So thank you for showing up again and again. Uh, if once again, if you have any stuff that you want want me, want me to cover on streams, hit me up at Luke at Become a uh, I'm always always into uh, finding out what you guys want to learn. And I'm always figuring out how to teach it as well, because that's uh, that's super super interesting as well. But wherever you are in the world, uh, if you're like quarantined or isolated or doing the so the social distancing thing, I really really appreciate it. Ah, uh, yeah. Oh, where's it gone? Yeah, Rex is saying wash hands as as always. Absolutely, keep washing your hands. Keep everyone safe. Keep everyone healthy. Uh, thanks again for showing up. I really appreciate it, and I'll see you on the next one. Have a good one. <laughs>